Yeah, man, it was uh, it was fun to connect. I love what you've been doing on LinkedIn, building your brand. We've both gotten roasted at SKO for posting oh. on LinkedIn, so uh, we we have that we have that in common. Hopefully, some clips from this uh, podcast here make it at SKO next year. Uh, but a few <laughs> a few accolades on Kyle for, for for those of you who are listening. So 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 get this, and, th- and this is real. So. He has made President's Club, I read, five consecutive years. You, at one point at Qualtrics, you were the top-performing corporate account executive, promoted to a sales leader, top-performing corporate team, and now you're a second-level leader, um, responsible for a pretty big number. And, and that's, that's really impressive. Um, it, it, it means a lot. Um, so I want to hear, I'll, I want you to take everyone back, and then we're going to talk about your frameworks today. We're going to talk about what you've been building, territory planning, discovery, solution presentation, closing the deal, maybe get a sneak peek to leadership frameworks. But take everyone back to the beginning. Why did you get into sales in the first place? By accident. I, uh, I was in a panic because I thought I wanted to go into consulting. I interned with a company in consulting and I hated every minute of it. And so when a Qualtrics recruiter reached out for an opportunity development position, I had no idea what that meant, but I took the interview. I went in, I literally told one of the co-founders of Qualtrics, I did not want to be in sales. And he (laughs) said, that's fine. We'll start you in sales and you can change later. You'll just have to take a pay cut. And I said, okay, it's not consulting. So I'll give it a shot. And I haven't been able to escape since. And, and something that's impressive about your career, Kyle, is, is, tra- is the trajectory. And, and that's what we're all about here at Sales Prestige, helping people get to the next level. And nobody has embodied that better than you. You had a really popular post on LinkedIn yesterday that I wanted to pull and get your thoughts on and, and how it relates to your career. It's people oftentimes ask you, Kyle, how can I be more successful? What have you done? How can I be like you? And you said, now that I've had more time to think about it, Top performers take complete ownership of their development. They consume coaching, enablement, support, listen to podcasts like this one, listen to your frameworks, and they shift their mindset from what's someone going to teach me today to to how am I going to learn today? And that's how you accelerate your career. So how has that mindset helped you get to the next level from SDR, account executive, sales leader, and then everything else you're going to continue to do? Yeah, it's... uh... It's really hard to teach something if you don't have a really good understanding of it yourself, right? So my entire career, I have tried to, to whatever extent I can, master the skill set of the role that I'm in and then be able to teach other people how to master that same role. When you can teach people to master the role that you're currently in, the natural next movement is a promotion to lead people that are in the role that you're currently in. So as an AE, I, I had to work really hard to figure out how to sell. And then I learned to teach how to sell. That helped me be a, a strong frontline leader. As a frontline leader, I learned how to teach people how to sell and how to how to lead teams. That helped me become a, a hopefully an okay second line leader. But every step of the process has been: look, nobody cares about my career more than I do. The best leaders in the world can't care more about their people's career than their people do. I've had to make sure that I'm holding myself accountable for my development and my improvements. And then I, I have the same expectation people that I work with. And that ongoing focus leads to learning and development. I feel like it's easy to look at someone like you and say, man, this guy has it all figured it out. Um, the way he does it, the frameworks, it's just the best practice. And, and that's how you carry yourself with that confidence. And it, it's something I resonate with and, and really appreciate. But take us back. D- did you just naturally come in? And I know you didn't want to get into sales where you just always good or what were some of those opportunity areas for you that you felt like you needed to develop early on to grow into the the, the rep and leader you are today yeah i uh i wish i could say i was always good that'd be a pretty cool story i uh, i sucked for a while my my low point at qualtrics was uh, literally being suspended for a day without pay i'm probably one of the few people at qualtrics to serve a one-day suspension um, I was almost put on a pip because I, I, there was one quarter where on the last day of the quarter, I was at $0 build, which to be at literally $0 on the last day of the quarter is probably the worst feeling in sales. I remember just pleading with the company to upgrade their small pilot license to a full license. It was like <laughs> $7,000. And so I closed $7,000 that quarter, which was terrible, but at least I didn't zero out, right? It, it actually took me... I, I was an AE level one for over two years, no promotions. I was watching my peers around me promote AE2, AE3. They were getting all the shout outs. I was looked at as a bottom performer 
and I was frankly lucky to keep my job at, at one point. Uh, so no, it, it hasn't always come easy. And I would say that even though I haven't necessarily hit those low points since then, every step in my career has led to additional struggles, trials, and difficulties as I've had to figure it out over again. Oftentimes, I, I feel like I need to learn through pain. And, and I, I see a lot of reps, they do things that they think are working until it doesn't work. And then they have this monumental pain moment, such as getting a one day suspension, such as not hitting quota, such as X, Y, Z. And, and I've had to really learn through that in my career to grow into the rep I am today. So a, as you think about that evolution and focusing on being good at your role in the moment, because I think that that's what I struggle with. And a lot of people as well is looking at other people around them and say, oh, they got a lucky inbound lead. Oh, they're performing better than me. Oh, I, I want to be in that position. And then as soon as you get to that second line VP, you say, okay, I want to get to the chief revenue officer, whatever it may be. So what advice do you have for someone to, to truly embody focusing on getting good at the role they're at today? Yeah, I love that question. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Teddy Roosevelt because that just feels like a really sophisticated thing to do on a podcast. Teddy it Roosevelt, he, he said, uh, comparison is the thief of joy, right? We've all heard that. I would add to that, comparison is also the thief of productivity, Every second that you're spending worrying about how somebody else is having success, how they're getting lucky inbounds, better territory, better customers, all that time and energy spent focusing on their success is time that you are not spent influencing yours. A big turning point in my career was realizing, look, like, who cares what other people are doing? I just need to sprint in my own lane, not stay in my lane. I'm going to sprint in my own lane, control what I can control. And I'm going to have to take ownership of whatever outcome happens. If I win, great. If I lose, that's on me. But absolutely nothing progresses by worrying about how somebody else is having success unless you're trying to learn so you can apply it to yourself. And in order to equip those reps out there that are looking to go fast, be in their own lane and develop, you have developed frameworks um, and, and you've been posting a lot on LinkedIn about this. And I, I know a lot of people follow you salesintroverts.com. I'm on the website right now. It's a good looking website and, and you have some products on there to help people. And you talk a lot about frameworks and you say framework greater than process. What is a framework? Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of explain it in the, the realm of how it's different than process. A framework is adaptable where a process is rigid. Uh, frameworks are intended to change over time or in different circumstances. And so an example of a process is a customer comes in and says, hey, I love your products. I need 10 users. I need to buy today. And the rep is like, look, I'm not even going to give you pricing. Let's go all the way back to discovery before we go to a demo. That's, that's process following a, a rigid structure. A framework would allow you to actually meet the customer where they are at their buying process and adapt the, the, the right aspect. The reason why I have dug into the framework greater than process or framework over process mindset is when you look at top performing reps and leaders, they're not just the ones that apply the process stricter or better than everyone else. They are the ones that know what a good process looks like, but then they adapt it and pivot based on who they're working with, the global economic climate, whatever is thrown at them. They're able to shift to what makes sense for the seller and the buyer in that moment. And I like how you just, you simplify it. You cut through a lot of the noise and just make it as simple as possible to say, Hey, this, this is how you could think about this to find more success sooner rather than later. So I want to go through some of these frameworks that you have developed one by one, because I have read many of them and I recommend to everyone listening to go check them out. Absolutely. And as we look at the begin, the top of the funnel, any rep here that's an SDR, AE, whatever role they may, they may be in, it all starts with pipeline. And I think a lot of reps are left scratching their heads saying, okay, I know I should be cold calling. I know I should be emailing. I should send some LinkedIn messages. But, but what I think a lot of people miss is the actual territory planning. And after reading your ebook, that's what I think has been the big shift for me recently is saying, rather than just trying to go follow ad hoc, these interesting moments and just low hanging fruit, how can I be more strategic and really prioritize my list of accounts, 
focus on the top 10 that have the highest potential from a spend potential. And then also the top 50 that I can be a lot more volume approach in them. So as you think about best practices, frameworks, when it comes to territory planning, how do you think about that? And what do you recommend your reps do? It, it always surprises me how few reps actually know their territory because the territory is how you make money, right? But whenever I would go through and I would do territory planning with reps, every time I said, hey, I need you to go through every single account one by one and manually prioritize it, every single time without fail, they found really good accounts they did not mm. know they had in their name. The reason for that is because nobody CRM has perfect quality data. Whatever account score is given to you by your sales ops team is imperfect. But reps just try to, honestly, they're a little bit lazy sometimes. They they're, they think they know their best accounts based on what sales ops gives them, and they rely on those. The other big mistake that reps make is they, they over-index on the size of the company, their revenue, number of employees, and they don't think enough about how well they understand the company. Like for me personally, I would much rather go sell Qualtrics to a mid-sized tech company where I really understand the use cases that they could use with Qualtrics. I understand their, the language they use, the outcomes they're trying to drive, the problems they're trying to solve. I would take that over selling to a, a Fortune 500 manufacturing company all day, every day, because I, I understand the language. And so advice number one, actually know every account in your territory and manually prioritize it. When you're prioritizing it, make sure you're considering if you were actually in a room with their executive team, could you sound like an intelligent salesperson selling to them? Or are you so out over your skis with their industry that you can't speak intelligently to them? If that's the case, I don't care the size of the company, you're not going to sell to them effectively. That's been one of the biggest evolutions I've had as a rep is understanding of the the organizations I'm working with, how do they actually make money? How do they bring in money? How do they equip their employees? Where are they investing? What are the departments? And the better you can understand that, the better you can understand what they're looking to achieve. And then the better you can correlate your solution as the holy grail. Hey, this is going to help you do this more successfully. And to your point, um, it's, it's a real thing. Going account by account, I did this. I, I have 1,600 accounts. And I'm not kidding. It took me over three weeks. It took me three weeks of spending 30 minutes to an hour a day going one by one. It takes forever, but I, I think it's starting to pay dividends the longer I start to prioritize the right accounts because it's going to naturally, I'm working bigger deals, higher deal value, which is going to help me get to my number sooner. So we've identified our accounts that takes us into pipeline generation. And something that I've talked a lot about that I learned from you that people absolutely love is a pipeline operating rhythm, associating a point value with the right activities that actually correlate to the outcomes you care about. And what I try and do, and I track myself very rigorously on this, is the point system of for every five, for every 10 new prospects I add to my sequence, that's one point. For every live conversation, that's one point. For every set meeting, that's one point. Um, for every qualified opportunity, that's one point. And then there's some other ones as well, but you wanna get eight points a day. How did you how did you think about this pipeline operating rhythm and how important is that for a rep to be able to to, to identify what does a one day look like? Yeah. So I I was exposed to my first iteration of a point system as an early AE and I hated it because the point system I was exposed to encouraged busy work. Like for example, it was mm -hmm. hey, if, if you if you make 10 calls, you get one point. Well, what that meant is if I had no if I had an empty calendar, and I had to make a bunch of calls. I would just call a stale list of 60 people, get six points and nothing would happen. And so I was like, well, I like the idea of accountability. I like the idea of measuring accountability because when you measure things, things improve, generally speaking. But if we're going to measure something, we need to measure what actually impacts a good day. So I worked with my team to define, hey, what are traits of a good day? What are the activities that we do that lead to positive outcomes? And that's where the categories were developed. And then we associated some point values to them. We figured out approximately how much time it would take to accomplish each of those points. That got us to eight hours in a day. That became eight points a day. And uh, then we rolled it out. And the reps that have applied it have had the most success. The other reason why I love it is it encourages, even on your busiest days, when you have lots of meetings, it's still encouraging pipeline generation. Mm -hmm. So that way you don't end up with that really bad lull where you're really, really busy and then you've got nothing. And then you have a good quarter, bad quarter. It just repeats like that. 
And as I think about my pipeline as a rep, something I look at is my pipeline health. So what is the status of having scheduled next events on all of my, on all of my active deals? And we have a metric called qualified pipeline, which is basically taking all of your active deals, looking at what stage it's in, such as discovery, solution presentation, business consideration, and then assigning a percentage dis- compared to the deal value saying, this is the likelihood of revenue you should recognize. And, and you can have a qualified pipeline amount of, you should fall within 10% of this number by the end of the quarter. You've talked a lot about using that number as a forecasting mechanism, as an individual contributor to, to really be disciplined to say, I need three, four X coverage going into a quarter or at any point in a given quarter. Can you talk about what else a rep should be looking at as they think about managing their pipeline and, and finding success with, with their prospecting, but also pipeline generation? Or pipeline management as well. Mm -hmm. So with pipeline and management, my favorite questions to ask a rep are what was the the last step of the deal? What was accomplished? And what are you hoping to accomplish with the next meeting? And when is it? That gives me a really good idea of velocity, right? If you have a pipeline full of deals and you have 100% SNE or scheduled next event, so all your deals have a, a calendar of next event, but every one of those calendar invites is a month out, and the agenda for every one of those deals is check in on status of the proposal, <laughs> then your pipeline's garbage, right? So what I'm looking for beyond the, the metrics is are we having meaningful conversations at a fast enough cadence to give me belief that we're actually going to close this deal? And that's where I, I look at the pipeline health aspects, not just do we have meetings on the calendar, but do we have meaningful meetings with a strong outcome tied to the meeting on the calendar soon enough for it to be a real deal. As a second line leader, what are you looking at to measure the health of your business, being that you have dozens of reps rolling up to you? Yeah, uh, the, the hard thing is, is uh, sales reps, shout out to my group, love you all. They're not the best at using Salesforce to track everything. And so it becomes a little bit hard to rely on a lot of the reports. And so I have to, I have to teach correct pipeline principles to my frontline leaders and then have them execute that to their reps. And so the same level of scrutiny that I have on our six figure deals, I expect my frontline leaders to have on deals down to probably about $40,000 or so. And then as I'm teaching them that level of scrutiny, they need to go teach their reps to have that same scrutiny on even their smaller deals. And so there's no way I can go look at all of the hundreds or even thousands of deals in my pipeline that that's not possible. But what I can do is teach my team what strong quality pipeline looks like, and then help them execute to keep it strong and progressing, and then trust that they handle their business as professionals and keep it clean. As you think about some of those scrutiny principles to measure pipeline health, what are maybe one to two of those most important items a rep should be focused on? I know you talked about what was the last meeting? When is the next event? What is the purpose of it? Me as a rep, I I really try and hold myself accountable to filling out medic, which is basically metric, um, compelling event, decision maker criteria. I won't, I won't go through all of them. So what would you encourage a rep to be looking at to ensure clean pipeline health? Yeah, I, I, I like medic. It's a good process. A lot of people know it. I also like to really simplify things and put it in buyer terminology and more comfortable seller terminology. So if I'm a rep looking at my pipeline, trying to gauge quality, uh, I'm looking at my later stage deals. The question I'm going to ask myself is if I gave them access to our platform today, how would they use it? Because if you can't answer that question and you're in a solution presentation or later, then your customer can't answer that question and they're not going to buy, right? So first question, how would they use my platform if I gave them access today? If we don't know the answer to that, you got to figure it out. You don't have a deal. Uh, the next question is what are the negative consequences of them not moving forward? Uh, a lot of people forget this aspect, but the reality is any change includes risk. And unless there is something really uncomfortable about the current state, it's not comfortable to take on the risk of change. And so in addition to how would they use, in our case, Qualtrics that they bought today, if they didn't move forward with a customer experience solution, what is the negative consequence associated with that? If I have those two things and I have meetings on the calendar, I've got a deal that we can go win. There might be other gaps, but if those two gaps are closed, then we're moving in the right direction. Deals really are a one and loss on discovery. And you just hit on two really important points as we think about 
the negative consequences, and then ultimately the positive outcome of how would they benefit from the solution. So we've talked about territory planning, pipeline generation, some pipeline health here. Now we're in discovery, which is what you're starting to get into. What are the, some of the biggest mistakes reps make doing discovery? I think the biggest mistake that reps make that can put senior buyers off from the very get-go is asking questions that make the buyer think that you know nothing about them. One of the biggest offenders is, hey, if it's selling to me, hey, Kyle, tell me about your role. I'm like, what do you mean my role? Like, do you want to talk about my role as it relates to recruiting, forecasting, performance management, uh, <laughs> pipeline generation? Like, what part of my role do you impact? Or if I compare that to the question, like, if I'm selling Clary, hey, Kyle, tell me about your role as it relates to forecasting at the region, team, and rep level, right? So mistake number one, asking questions that make your buyer think you don't know them. Because if your buyer thinks you don't know them, they're going to wonder, why do you think you can help me? This is a waste of my time. I think the other big mistake that reps make is thinking that discovery is purely for a value extraction. They think that it's time for the seller to get value and understand the buyer, when really the buyer is there for only one reason, to determine as quickly as possible if they should keep talking to you, if there's value there. So the other mistake reps make is one, they don't teach enough in the discovery. They don't differentiate by how they sell. They try to differentiate by what they sell. And then the other mistake is not giving them a concrete value hypothesis at the beginning and then a strengthened one at the end of the call to make sure the buyer feels like they're not wasting their time with you in discovery. And an important part of discovery is the decision process and who is the economic buyer. So if you're meeting with, let's say, a director of marketing and, and they identify, yeah, we, we hate our solution today. It's terrible. We're losing all this money and time, et cetera, et cetera. We need your solution. So you identify that there's a need there, but you start to identify that it's actually the, the VP of marketing that's going to be able to make the decision on sign on the dotted line here. How do you go about convincing your, you don't maybe know if they're a champion or a cheerleader or if they're able to advocate for you. How do you go from speaking with this program admin or person that can influence to then getting access to their higher level and the executives that will ultimately be able to sign on the dotted line. You got to motivate them. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to take on the risk of introducing a salesperson to their boss, to their boss's boss, unless there's something in it for them. And so my first priority in a deal is to whoever I'm talking to, regardless of their level, how do I help this individual win? How do I get them excited enough that they're going to be willing to go introduce me to somebody else or at least help me understand the perspective of somebody else? Once I'm attached to something that they personally care about, how they get promoted, how they get paid more, how they feel more valuable, whatever it is, once they're personally motivated, I can then enable them to introduce me to that higher level person by asking questions like, hey, I understand your priority is X. Help me understand from your VP's perspective, why is this program failing them? It's really hard to ask that question though until they're motivated enough to help you because people are intrinsically a little bit selfish, right? Like they have to have that personal one to go that far and to support you in that way. So let's say you've, you've built that case. They say, this is a slam dunk. Let's bring in everybody. So now we set up our solution presentation demo. And something that I've learned from you that you talk a lot about is, is one, you need to be able to answer the question, how specifically will they, they use this solution? And which of these features specifically will they benefit from most? Not just knowing that you've done the demo a thousand times, let's show everything in the kitchen sink, but let's be very intentional with where we start and the value they will recognize from this specific feature or two. So how do you think about solution presentations when you coach your reps to, to ensure that it's well received by the team? Yeah. Number one, know your audience, right? Like if I'm, if we're pulling in a new stakeholders that are much more senior, that's going to be a very different demonstration than if we're just presenting to the, the functional users. So number one, know your audience. What do they care about? What is most important to them for the solution and what is success going to look like? Uh, then with the, with the demonstration itself, you said it really well. What are the areas that were different that are going to cause the most impact for them? And it becomes a story. It's, hey, I, I, let, me, let me walk you through first, just really quickly, the things that everybody offers so you know that we have it. I want to spend most of our time, though, talking through feature A, feature B, feature C. The reason why I want to show those features is because they're different in raise one, two, three, and that's going to bring this value to you. Then I want to go show those features. 
I want to express again why it matters, tell a story or two for the impact they can expect, and that would conclude the demo. Uh, but if they if they see a, a typical demo, it's going to look like all of your competitors. If 80% of what you show is common functionality, it's going to look identical to your low cost competitors. You have you have that one chance to make them feel and experience something different. And in my experience, the best way to do that is by highlighting differentiators and tying emotional stories to why those differentiators matter. After you demo, the customer typically is thinking, okay, what, what is it going to cost? How do we get this done? How do you build urgency from that point in the demo? Because what I've experienced being a rep in the role for a year um, is I'll do the demo. I'll set up another call to say, we're going to talk about pricing. We'll do pricing. And, and then we end up in this, this stalemate of them needing to do whatever internally. And maybe I don't understand the process well enough, but then we're just going back and forth. We have that meeting a month out. What's the status of the proposal? I, I think a lot of deals are lost that way. You lose the momentum, the excitement, the urgency. So how do you go from solution presentation to eventually naturally you're, you're in business consideration, but then how do you keep the momentum to then get, get to the close? Yeah, that's a when when people say, "Why don't you send me over the proposal and we'll circle back and turn it and get back to you?" That is where most deals are actually lost. Yeah, the, it's tough. The reason for that is if you don't know the next steps to make a sale, it is extremely likely that your buyer does not know the next steps to make a purchase. Right? They don't know who to loop in. They don't know how to get approval. They don't know how to move forward. So there's a couple parts to this. One part is the urgency part. The only way to have urgency is if we have strong and negative consequences for not moving forward. If we have not identified and agreed on negative consequences, there's really not going to be any urgency. And that has to be established even before the proposal is shared. Now, once you've established negative consequences, there's buy-in that your solution can solve those and bring positive outcomes, proposal is shared, it's really important that you maintain control of the deal. So you send, you, you send it over, they say, hey, this is great, let me circle up internally, get back to you. That's when you have to proactively say it, that makes perfect sense. I wanna make sure those discussions for you are really easy. Oftentimes they're with IT around system integrations and with finance around ROI and whether or not this is going to be worth the money spent. Can we take a few minutes and talk about who on your side would be involved in that? What you think would stand out most from our solution for them? Then I'll package up everything we've talked about so far into content specific for those new audiences so your internal syncs are much easier for you to have. This way, we're doing a couple of things. One, we're advising them what next steps should be. I know IT has to be involved. I know finance has to give sign off. And I'm maintaining control by giving a logical next step. The next step isn't to go check in with them. The next step is to go better understand these new stakeholder groups, work together to build out content that defends the purchase of our solution from the perspective of those new groups. And now we can keep momentum of the deal with logical next steps. If we follow everything you've shared here today, we're going to go crush our quotas, close millions of dollars, be successful individual contributors, and eventually face the question, maybe I should go into leadership. And that's what you've done as well. And I think that that's what's so brilliant about what you've created is you have a multiplying effect of, I can be a successful rep, but I can now go to a leader and, and impart those principles to then impact more people. And that actually creates more value than you just crushing your quota if you can help the majority of people be 10% better than what they normally would be. So I know you're, you're building out leadership principles. You don't need to share any sneak peeks or too deep into it, but what's, what's maybe one, one, two things you've learned now that you've, you've evolved from a, a frontline sales manager to now a second line leader. What, what are some of those learning lessons that you, that you've learned dealing with people? I've learned that there is very little structure and coaching around how to be a successful frontline leader. And there's even less for how to be a successful second line leader. By the time you get into more senior leadership roles, most of the content is a high level strategy or mindset, which is super valuable, don't get me wrong. But it's not exactly, hey, this is day one on the job as a new sales manager, what do I do? And so what I'm trying to build out with my frameworks is, hey, here are the skills that AEs need to have. And for a frontline leader, here's how you can go teach those skills. Here's example coaching sessions that you can run. Here's how you're gonna track the progress. 
Here's how you can run effective deal reviews. Here's how you run effective forecast reviews. All those things that if I would have known day one as a frontline leader, I would have experienced a lot less pain and heartache and my team would have gotten a lot less frustrated with me as I tried to figure out how to successfully lead teams within a, uh, a scalable framework that actually led to consistent rep improvement. That's fantastic. Um, and this will be the last question, Kyle. So I, I know that you've built out salesintroverts.com and I would encourage everyone to go on there, check it out, go learn more about Kyle. And you can even go deeper on some of these frameworks that we've talked about here today, because I wanted to cover all of them, each part of, of territory planning, pipeline generation, discovery, solution presentation, closing. Um, but those frameworks go much deeper on them. Um, in order to build your brand. You've been active on LinkedIn, putting yourself out there. You, you always comment very insightful things on, on people's posts. You always put out a lot of content. What is What has been your experience the last six months going from m maybe just a, a mild participator of, of, of just focusing on your job, doing what you're doing to now trying to help people and put yourself out there online? What's that experience been like? It's been so fun. I, um, it, was, it was uncomfortable at first, for sure. But I realized I've been so incredibly fortunate in my career to be placed in opportunities to learn and to grow. And a lot of people don't have that. And so if I can give people some purview into what I've been able to see and experience and it helps them grow, it's going to create more people that can also have a multiplier effect. I, I think the I've gotten messages lately about people that applied my frameworks and they got a job in sales for the first time, or they doubled their conversion rate in my QMs, or they got a promotion to leadership. And when I get those messages, I'm just grateful that I started the, the journey because these are people that I never would have even been exposed to that are now able to, to take advantage of my good fortune, my good luck, my good circumstances. So I feel like it's been a really rewarding way to to share the the remarkable good fortune I've had in my career so far and hopefully get a lot of other people enjoying sales because sales is an awesome profession when it's done the right way. And I, I, I would love more people to get to appreciate that like I've been able to. Everyone, go show Kyle some support. I'm going to put a link to his LinkedIn page down below and also salesintroverts.com. Go visit the website. If you're still with us, subscribe to the channel now. Have a great rest of the day. See ya.